All right. Shalom. First and foremost, I want to give all praise, all honor, and all glory to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Racha Kodash. I also want to give double honors to our apostles and our elders of Great Millstone that rule well, peace, blessing, and many salutations unto you elect across the four winds of this earth, fulfilling your lot to our truth and all sincerity. I am the priest Sha'ar from the Great Millstone Dallas branch coming to you all with another lesson which is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Lord willing, this lesson here will be edifying and comforting to you all that are of the flock. Um, this past week, or I'd rather say um, about a week ago, we had a few of the bishops from Connecticut that came down to Dallas to visit us. And as they was here, there was a lot of um, bread that was broken, some good fellowship and through the spirit and um, a lot of wisdom that was imparted from those men that was down here. And um, just thinking back to something that the Bishop Sakharan said while he was down here, he said, wherever you go, you always look for the enemy. All right. Not and what he means when he said that, obviously, you're not everywhere you go. It ain't like you have a dire obsession to just spot out who it is, you know, that don't like you. That's not what he's talking about. But wherever you go, whether it's at the store, whether you're at the bar, whether you're at work. You know, your enemy is always there present. Even the scriptures talks about Satan as a roaring lion seeking to and fro, walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, devour. And that's loosely paraphrasing. But you have the spiritual demon Satan whose spirit influences people that are on this earth, predominantly the nation of Esau, Edom. And as we are made a, a skeptical on the earth, as we're out on the highways and the hedges, as we do these lessons in these shows, we're definitely spotted by a lot of our enemies that are out here. So don't be surprised that they have that pe that they have people, excuse me, that might follow you around or whatever the case might be. And ultimately, us being the Israelites, you so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans, there is a generational enemy that's been here since we've been here as a nation of people. And we say this often, when you look at the Bible, all right, this Bible is namely given unto the Israelites. You have the Heavenly Father, whose name was Yahweh, which is the God of Israel. You have the beloved, only begotten Son, whose name is Yahweh Shai, which is an Israelite of the tribe of Judah. And then you have the Israelites, the true Israelites that I hid. And the Israelites are the protagonists under Yahweh Shai of the Bible, of the earth, of existence. According to the Bible, you have a protagonist and you have an antagonist. Just as you have God and then Yahweh Shai, who the world calls Jesus, and then you have Satan, there's a seed on the earth that is moved and invigorated off of righteousness, and that seed being the Israelites, namely the elect out of the nation of Israel. And then you have the Edomites, which the Edomites are going to have their role here in the last days as well. The scriptures declares that. And we believe that according to prophecy and just spiritual extrapolation, when you read the scriptures, we know and believe that to be the, the Caucasian race as they proclaim themselves as being white, which really they're not white. Okay, white is really, it really represents purity and such. And when you look at the MO of the Caucasian race on the planet Earth, I mean, they've done everything on the earth that's literally void of uh, purity and such, okay? And I'm just calling a spade a spade, but naturally when you go into the Bible, all right, it's about the Israelites and the Israelites have an antagonist or an enemy on the earth and that enemy is the nation of Esau, Edom, which is the white race. And as they've existed here on the earth, as they've had their time and an influence uh, under Satan on the planet earth, they've been uh, doing a lot of things that the scriptures said they would be doing. And this would be an indicator or something to identify who they are. And that is them giving the sword. And as they've had the sword, which a sword is a device used to slay, to kill, to pierce and such, since they've had their role on the planet earth and rulership, that's namely what they've been known for. All right, creating um, 
when I say creating weaponry, obviously, when you look at every nationality under the sun in history, they've all had something to do with weaponry. But when it comes to the advancement of modern day weaponry, when it comes to the gun, bombs, missiles and so forth. OK, I mean, you know, the Edomites that are here, today's Edomites, which, again, I said who they are earlier. They've been the main ones that have modified and evolutionized weaponry when it comes to, the, um, you know, weapons and such. OK, and we can say physical weaponry, but even the idea. All right. Um, you have chemical warfare, biological warfare, warfare on the mind. They've evolutionized every aspect of weaponry on the earth. And when you look at this here and identify this man according to, uh, according to prophecy, all fingers point to the nation of Esau Edom, who is the so-called white race on the earth. And the reason why I wanted to go into all of that and say all of that circles right back around to what the elder said. You know, we're supposed to be able to spot our enemy. And when you look at modern day Christianity here, they'll talk about the enemy this, the enemy that. You know, as the scriptures say, you're going to have your, 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 your the, the enemy are going to be your footstool and such. But they fail to identify who the enemy actually is. And the Bible gives us a clear indication of who the enemy is. And he will be the main one in history repetitively that would have the spirit of wanting to slay his brother Jacob. Just as the scriptures say, just as the scriptures say, and his fulfillment of that and what he wants to do is to pierce you. And put his mark within you, which is what the scriptures say, which is what the scriptures goes into. So I'm going to pull out a few scriptures going into this man, E, and how he's been given a lot of the sword. And these scriptures here are going to help identify and prove that he is the seed of Satan and the Edomite on the planet Earth. So the first scripture that I'm going to go into is going to be in the book of um, Revelation, the first chapter. And I'm going to jump straight to the point here because there's an indicator here to show forth who he is and how he was going to have his role here even on the last days before our Lord Yahweh makes his grand return. So this here is the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. And it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. And this he is talking about who the world calls Jesus Christ, whose real name is Yahweh And when he makes his return and when he makes his coming on the earth, he's going to eradicate the evildoers that are on the face of this earth. And in verse seven, what I'm reading is going to identify these evildoers that he's going to come and visit. It's going to identify who they are and the spirit they would be in. And it's very subtle when you read this here in Revelation one and seven. But again, when you read these prophecies and when you identify who this man is via the prophecies, it all links together to one nation of people on the planet earth. And that being the nation of Esau, Edom. So Revelation 1 and 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so Amman. So particularly, when you read this in verse 7, it talks about how he's going to come with clouds, which those clouds are talking about the chariots, the so-called UFOs, and brothers have been doing very beautiful, very edifying lessons going in to those chariots, which is why these higher up officials of E, Esau, are, are so spooked right now. All right. And I said that earlier in a lesson I did earlier this week, or a lesson I did earlier this week. They're seeing these clouds and these chariots a lot more than what we think. So the reason why they're speeding up that wrath, why they're speeding up this, this new digital dollar that they're trying to create, they're speeding up this new world order is because they see these signs in the heavens and they're dismayed by them. So they're trying to speed up their process of their, 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 their rulership on the earth and their dominance on the earth. But it's ultimately going to be them speeding up their demise. And the point in verse seven says, and they also which pierced him. Now you can go into the account of our Lord Yahweh Shai, how he was pierced by a Roman soldier. And let's pull that up here in the book of St. John. Hold on one sec. Hopefully I'm spelling it right. Yeah. This is the book of St. John, chapter 19. 
And this is going into the account where our Lord was actually pierced. And it's going to show forth who pierced him. So this is the book of St. John. Hold on. It's the book of St. John, chapter 19. And I'm going to start at verse... Let's start at verse 30, 32. And this is going into when our Lord Yahweh Shai was crucified. And it says, Then came the soldier and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. And this soldier is talking about as a Roman soldier. All right. These are Roman soldiers that was there and that was present when our Lord Yahweh Shai was crucified. And the legs of those that was broken were those two male factors that was crucified with our Lord Yahweh Shai. And you can read about those two male factors. One of them repenting before he gave up the ghost and one of them continually being a demon before he gave his last breath. And Yahweh Shai was present with those individuals as they were crucified because the scriptures had to be fulfilled, saying that he was numbered also with the transgressors. But here's the point, because you had the Roman soldiers that break the legs of those two male factors that was crucified with our Lord Yahweh Shai. And verse 33 says, but when they came to Yahweh Shai and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. So here it says one of the soldiers, which was a Roman, by the way. And if you don't know who those Romans were back then, which I'm pretty sure you all that are listening have an idea, especially if you listen to these lessons that we do. These are Idumian or Edomites who was given a sword to cut. When you read the blessing that was given unto Esau, Edom, in the book of Genesis, chapter 27. And Lord, well, I'm going to pull that here in a second. But this is a Roman soldier that pierced him. And even when you go into the word pierced here in the Greek, you have the word niso. Strong's G, 3572, nuso. Nuso. Okay, well, it's nuso, which ironically sounds like the word noose. All right. Now, obviously, a noose is a, a rope tied in a loop meant to hang people. All right. But hey, the scriptures also say, curse be any man that hangeth on a tree, you know. But nevertheless, you know, he was pierced. OK, it wasn't like he had a rope tied around his neck. It was hung, but he was pierced. But I just found that interesting because, you know, that word noose is significant within our culture, even to this day, which shows that he is of our people. But when you go into this word nuso. It says pierce to pierce, often of severed or even deadly wounds given one. All right. So when our Lord Yahweh Shai comes back with those clouds, he's going to come back and visit that Roman soldier that pierced him. Just as is written in Revelation, the first chapter. And if you understand reincarnation, all right, it's not far fetched to believe that that soldier that pierced him then is here today fulfilling his lot in these last days. But what also stands out. When you go back to Revelation, the first chapter, in the seventh verse, it says, they which pierced him. All right. So not only is he going to come back and visit the soldiers that had to do with this crucifixion, the soldier that pierced him. But you have these people that have the M.O. of piercing. And I went into the word pierced here just a little bit ago. And let's go into it again. All right. Because I went into it in John 19, which was new. So and right here in Revelation one. You have the word uh, pierce, meaning to dig through or to pierce or to dig out. All right. And I did a lesson a few weeks ago, touching up on a piercing serpent, touching up on Leviathan and tying him to E, the Edomites here today. And they've been given the M.O., especially in these last days. But even when he was a nation of people to be the people that was going to rule the earth with the sword. And with that sword, he was going to pierce the Israelites, kill off the Israelites. That was that general idea that was in the Edomites head. Right. Which is why they had such a disdainment towards you so-called Negroes, Latinos and Native Americans, even within the very recent past. All right. And our people can look at it and say, why did they do this? Why did they do such heinous atrocities? And they can try to figure out. But you got to be spiritual to understand this. The only way to truly understand why the so-called white race or the Caucasian race has had such a disdainment towards you people is you having to look and have understanding of the Bible. And you have to know who Jacob 
and Esau is. It's only so much marching and affirmative action that you can do. All right. That still is going to give you the full understanding on having the answer or understanding of why these things are happening. And again, once you actually read the scriptures, once the spirit of the Lord subs with you, you'll understand these things. Even our beloved forefather Asaph made mention when he read this here in the book of Psalms, the uh, 73rd chapter or the 73rd Psalm, it goes into his, his um, how can I put this, his um, jealousy to a degree, or I'd rather say he was envious at the wicked because they prospered. And we look at it today. All right. Even to this day. The Israelites, when you look at our people in a nutshell, are still the bottom of the totem pole. Now, granted, of course, there are certain laws and such that are passed to kind of help our people get out of a ditch. But there's still a negative M.O. or a stigma that's on our people, which is why you're still getting pulled over by the cops, which is why you're always getting killed by the cops unjustly, which is why you're getting thrown in jail unjustly, which is why we're the, the nation of the leading, the leading cause of... Um, abortions, and so forth, all right? There's this stigma that's on you, and you are always sought after by these people, by the Edomites. And again, it's spiritual once you understand this. It ain't nothing that this physical world can reveal unto you, all right? You have to be spiritual to really understand why. And when you read this here in the book of Psalms, chapter 73, the, ver uh, the third verse, and this again is a, a psalm, of Asaph, who was the, the lead recorder of the choir that King David set up. And when you read this here, it says, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And when you understand who the wicked is, it makes a lot of, un it makes a lot of sense why he was so prosperous within his kingdom. All right, even in 2 Ezra, the sixth chapter, it says, For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. So as he's in his current world, he's going to prosper. Even in the book of Numbers, the 24th chapter, it goes into Amalek, who was the head house of Edom. And it said Amalek was going to be first out of all the nations, which that applies here within these last days. Which is why Yahweh Shai said, the scriptures say, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Currently, our Amalek and E being the, 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 the rulers on this earth, the head nation on this earth, they're going to be first on a lot of things, which is why they prosper. But when he continue, it says, for there is no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. And now we're coming into the points of prophecy where the curses that we've received are now being passed on to them. But let's go into the point. Therefore, pride can pass them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. There goes that violence, just as I read, pierced. Yahweh Shai is going to come to those that pierced him. And you can't pierce somebody in a calm, tranquil way. That's a form of violence there. Even when you go into the word, it's Hamas, which is cruelty, injustice, wrong, or violence, or to oppress. Okay? Damage. See, Habashai is going to come to those that pierced him, and they pierced in a very violent fashion. And yeah, he was pierced when he was dead, but his whole people was pierced, being the Israelites. They were pierced. They were stricken by the Edomites. They suffered violence. They even it's written of in the book of Matthew, I believe, what, Matthew 11, where it says from the days of John the Baptist, even until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. And the way they took it by force was through them ruling with the sword, which was meant to pierce. And I said it a little bit ago that what the way they want to fulfill that is to pierce the people on this earth with this mark you can read about in Revelation, the 13th chapter. The word is also karagma, which literally goes to imprinting something in the flesh, in the skin, just as the word nuso for pierce in the book of John. I'm sorry, in the book of, um, I'm sorry, not nuso. The other word for pierce in Revelation, the first chapter, which means to dig. All right. So hopefully this is coming together so far. But let's go on to the point here. Because ultimately, Asaph made up this complaint, but he also brings out the balance of it going into how he understood why when he came into the understanding of the Lord. So this is Psalm 73 and 17. It says, until I went into the sanctuary of the Most High, then I understood their end. 
And the only way to truly understand their end is you have to be blessed with this knowledge. All right. It ain't no marching that's going to help you understand their end. Affirmative action is not going to help you to understand their end. It's only the Lord supping with you. And that's going to truly allow you to understand the end. And you understand why they did what they did. And that goes into, as I said earlier, a perpetual ancient hatred that they had even from the beginning. Which is why I want to pull this up here in the book of um, Ezekiel, the 35th chapter. And this again is a judgment given unto E or Esau. Now, right here, it makes mention of Seir, but Seir is synonymous for E because they dwelt in the mountains of Seir and in, in Mount Seir. All right. Which is um, translated Sha'ayar from the ancient Hebrew, which means hairy. All right. And when you read it in Genesis 25, it goes into the birth of Jacob and Esau. And it says Esau came out hairy as a garment. Matter of fact, let's get that really quick. This is the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verse 25. And it says, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. And I'm interested to see what the word hairy is here. And behold, you have Sha'ayar, which is also Seir. So spiritually, he was given Mount Seir as an inheritance. And Mount Seir, how it was pronounced in ancient Hebrew, is Sha'ayar, just as how E is personified in Genesis 25, verse 25. So it says, red all over like a hairy garment, and he was called E or Esau. All right, and you can read the two chapters later in Genesis 27, where it was given a, a blessing was given unto E, and that he was going to rule the earth with the sword. And what did he do with that sword? He pierced, he killed, he ruled the earth in violence, just as the scripture said. All right, so let's jump back to what I was reading here in the book of Ezekiel, the 35th chapter. And where I left off at, not Ezekiel 5, Ezekiel 35, forgive me. So this is back in Ezekiel 35 and 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir. And when you go into the word Seir here in the Hebrew, behold, you have Sha'ayar, which is the same word for Harry in Genesis 25 and 25. It even says Seir, Harry or Shaggy. And it says, a patriarch of the Horites, the inhabitants of Edom, before the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, the land of Edom, south of the Dead Sea, a mountain range in Edom extending from the Dead Sea to the Atlantic Gulf. It says, apparently also called Mount Seir and extending most of the distance of the mountain range itself. All right. So when you look at this definition of Seir, all fingers point to Esau, Edom. So in Genesis 35, this is a prophecy against Esau, Edom. And in this prophecy, we're told to set our face against Mount Seir. All right. Or set our face against Esau. And as we do that, what would be given in our testimony? We were going to identify who he is in prophecy. And we're going to tell you who is going to be visited by our Lord when he comes back. Just as it was written, even they that pierced him, he shall come with clouds and punish those, even they that pierced him. And who was that? That's talking about the Edomites. Who was given the sword? Who ruled the earth in violence? Just as the scripture said. Now it says, and say unto this, and say unto it, thus saith the Lord, Yahweh, behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So every city... Every region that E possesses is going to be dealt with. It's going to be made desolate. Babylon is going to be made desolate. All right. The, the, the current land of, um, I, you know, I don't want to get my page done, but that area where the small hats are, that's going to be made desolate. Where those Russians are, that's going to be made desolate and other various parts. But the main desolation is going to be in the land of Mystery Babylon. That's where the main, that's the main place that's going to be demolished, so to speak. In verse five is the point. It says, because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and shed the blood of the children of Israel by force of the sword, which is meant to pierce in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord, I will prepare unto thee blood and blood shall pursue thee. Since thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. All right. 
So he's going to tell you that, look, there's going to be a bloodbath that they're going to have to experience on their own. All right. And you can read about that bloodbath in Isaiah 63, where Yahweh Shai comes back to visit Idumia. And you can also read about it in Revelation, the first chapter, which I read how he comes with clouds and he's going to punish those even they that pierced him. All right. Yes, he was physically pierced by those Idumians. He sure was by those Roman soldiers. And he's going to come back and visit the soldiers that was involved in that. And on top of that, he's going to come back to visit the nation that pierced him, which is the nation of is Israel. All right. So hopefully that made sense. I wanted to touch up on the point. I didn't want to make that too long, but I want to give all praise, all honor, and all glory to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Rechakodash. I also want to give double honors to our apostles and our elders of Great Millstone. Peace, blessing, and many salutations unto you elect across the four ones of this earth, fulfilling your lots in all truth and all sincerity. Shalom.